To start us off, we have senior advisor Christina Alnes from Cicero. Christina has worked extensively with the relationship between climate and finance. She is here to tell us about global trends within climate finance. Please welcome Christina Alnes. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, and thank you, Francis, for the introduction and also for the opportunity to speak here. It's such an honor to be at DRIVA with all of you, and I'm really excited to have some more conversations, especially during the party afterwards. So in about the next 15 minutes, I'm going to walk you through some global trends in climate finance. Um, so I work for CISRO. We're an interdisciplinary research institute, and this is our obligatory bragging slide. As you can see here. Um, as you can see here, my colleagues have contributed to synthesizing the status of our climate with the International Panel on Climate Change since 1992. And some of them have admitted to me that, quite frankly, it's been a little bit depressing. Um, we're also a pioneer of climate finance research. And we've also worked with green bonds, uh, providing environmental reviews of green bonds for about 10 years now. So when I started working with uh, the topic of sustainability in business about 10 years ago, um, these quotes here, which are recent quotes uh, on the link between finance and climate. So when I first started in this industry, the top one would maybe be from, say, an MP or po politician from the Green Party, perhaps. And the bottom one here would be maybe from a very left-leaning academic or perhaps an NGO report like Greenpeace. And actually, this top is one is from a, an op-ed authored by both the governor of the Bank of England and the governor of the Bank of France. And this is launching a recent report, an initiative they have, to look at financial policy and climate change. And the bottom one here is from, this is from the press release of a recent BlackRock report. And BlackRock is the world's largest asset manager. So when BlackRock comes out with a report and a type of statement like this, it's basically the same as saying that climate risk has become mainstreamed in the financial sector. So this is the first global trend, and that is that climate risk and climate finance is a trend within the global finance community. So all of the leading international financial institutions, they are looking at climate change and they're looking at climate risk and also the opportunities here. And why is this? And this is because their investors are both already feeling the impacts of climate change on their portfolios, and they're seeing that the world needs to go through a quite dramatic transition. And within this, there are both risks and opportunities for them. So I'm going to talk briefly about both, but focus most on the opportunities because it's frankly more fun. So in terms of the risks, when you talk about climate change and the impacts on finance, very often the risks are um, put into two broad categories. So the first is the physical impacts of climate change. And this is an area where we at Cicero have done a lot of work. So we had a couple of years ago, we came out with a report, Shades of Risk, which is looking at the key risks per region that investors need to start caring about already now. And now we're working on a project uh, where we're bringing together scientists and investors to see if we can co-develop indicators for climate risk. And this is very challenging, especially because the scientists and the investors do not even close to speak the same language. And that has nothing to do with the fact that it's a pan-European project. Um, and in terms, so that's the physical side. And in terms of the, the other, this is a transition risk. So this could be risks linked to technology, policy, or liability. And a really interesting example of this type of risk was last year. So California is known for its wildfires. And last year, there was a particularly bad wildfire. With climate change, these are expected to increase. The utility PG&E here, they were held liable for some of these wildfires because they often start in the electrical grid and grid infrastructure. And last year, they filed for bankruptcy because of these liabilities, or because of this liability. So this was 
what both uh, the Wall Street Journal and Forbes called the first climate change, change bankruptcy from a Fortune 500 company. So this is part of the reason why investors are thinking about climate change and climate finance. Um, and something that the financial sector is really good at is taking risks and turning them into opportunities. So that's um, what I'm going to talk most about now. So this is the growing trend of so-called environmental social governance uh, investing. And these are signatories to the PRE, which is the Principles for Responsible Investing. These principles are both voluntary and aspirational, so this is in a way the absolute broadest sense of the climate or social sustainability investing universe. Uh, however, the trend is impressive, and last year, $80 trillion were invested uh, of assets under management were held by signatories of the PRE. What we're also seeing to get um, a bit more specific, and one of the reasons why it's so fun to work in this field, is that there's so much innovation and there's a whole suite of tools and strategies being developed by investors in this space. So if you look at the equity side, on the public, in public equities, there's a whole range of socially responsible investing or ESG strategies. And the next speaker is a really good and interesting example of one of these. And when you look at private equity, there is an increasing amount of investors that are just like Nisna, where they have really high environmental, but also really high financial demands in terms of the returns. So these are investors that are demanding both. Uh, and if you look at the debt side here, there's a whole range of new, very specific financial products being developed linked to climate change. So the green bonds are the most well-known, and these were the oldest um, financial product in this sense, if you will. They've been around for about 10 years. And green bonds are bonds where the proceeds go towards climate change or environmental projects. Um, what a sort of cousin of the green bonds is the social bonds, which are similar except that the social bonds have some sort of social impact for the projects. And then you have sustainability bonds where you must meet both of these in addition to financial return, also environmental and social impact. On the loan side, there's green loans, quite um, self-explanatory. And a very interesting new product that came out last year, which are sustainability-linked loans. So here, actually, the sustainability or ESG, environmental, social, and governance rating of the company who is issuing these loans, that is tied to the financial uh, terms of the loan. So the, if the uh, rate, finance sustainability rating goes up and down, that impacts the terms of the loan and how much the issuer has to pay back. And this is just some of the most common tools that are being developed. Every week we hear about new potential opportunities and lots of innovation going on in this field. So I'm expecting that this universe is just going to multiply and multiply. Um, to give an example from the green bonds, which is the most developed of these markets, here, this is the global green bond market last year. About 180 billion um, US dollars of issuance last year. Uh, and of course, this is again, the green bond market again has seen exponential growth. Interesting here is that the European markets were really the first ones out and they were, um, really the front runners. And in Sweden, our neighbor, is where you see the largest share of green bonds per, in terms of the bonds issued. But like with a lot of other global markets, you have the US and China competing to be the global leader here. And they have very different approaches, perhaps not surprising. So in the US, it's, it's all market driven. And I actually have the impression that some of the, especially cities and municipalities, that are issuing green bonds are doing it almost to spite what's going on in the Trump White House. And <laughs> don't quote me on that though, <laughs> just a feeling. Um, however, in China, it's of course completely different. So the Chinese government, they have a whole range of policies that are geared towards 
um, influencing and, and creating a green bond market and also to become a leader in climate finance. And they have a stated goal that they're going to be a leader in this space. So this is, the Chinese market is a very interesting one to watch uh, when it comes to green bonds. So this is in the last, this is a, a broad overview and I wanted to end on giving a couple of examples of different climate finance tools so you can see what actually gets financed and the types of projects that are going on in this space. So the first is a sovereign green sukuk issued by Indonesia last year. So a sukuk is an Islamic finance fixed income instrument. So it's very similar to a green bond, but there is in fact an, an own market for Islamic investors who want green investments. And that's what they took advantage of here. So the projects that will be financed, they um, are both adaptation and mitigation projects, and they go towards supporting Indonesia's nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement. So supporting a country's uh, projects and contributions under the Paris Agreement and to meet that global agreement. The next case study is a little bit more business-like, and this is a sustainability bond issued also last year from the Agricultural Development Bank of China. And this, uh, these projects have both an environmental and a social goal attached to each and every one of them. And here you can see the types of projects that they can finance. So this ranges from sustainable water management in rural China and sustainable agriculture to renewable energy, affordable housing, and basic services. So a whole range of projects implemented often on a micro scale, but issued as uh, a quite substantial bond. And the last case study that I wanted to show you is a project that we're working on with NISNA, both with NISNA and several other leading actors in the Norwegian financial sector. So this is a little bit closer to home. And what we wanted to do here is We've seen that in a lot of these debt markets, transparency for investors has been really key and more information has been really key to drive these markets. So we wanted to take the experience that we have in climate research and in green bonds and see if we could apply that to provide the same level of transparency to companies for investors. What we um, have started with is to say that for most people it's easy to know the difference between say the dark brown coal investments on one hand and the dark green if you will the solutions that are already aligned with the 2050 agreements so this could be renewable energy as a, um, as an example but what is in between here is a little bit more tricky to understand so the core idea of what we're trying to do is to see if we can help differentiate between all of these different shades of brown and green. And um, this methodology here is something that I'm very happy to talk in more detail with any of you afterwards in the break. Uh, but one of the core concepts, and I think this is especially interesting here in Stavangir, is that for this climate transition, we need all industries and sectors. So we can't just go and look at the dark green solutions. We actually also need the companies that are currently operating more on the brown scale to move their operations towards the greener investments and the greener side. So this is one of the core issues that we would like to work with uh, more in the future is to transition all sectors. Uh, and use climate finance as a vehicle for this. Some key takeaways, and I actually think this last point is a really good one to end with here in Stavangir and open it up for some questions. Um, something key as well is that what we've seen in climate finance is that this transparency and communication has been really important. So the, um, when you're working with green bond issuers, uh, then and with the investors, they're building capacity on uh, climate finance and they're building capacity on climate change. And the involvement of climate researchers and other environmental experts like CISRO helps facilitate this conversation and helps really grow the market. And you can use the competitive aspects of the financial industry in your advantage by facilitating this communication. And uh, as I said, again, all industries and sectors are needed in this transition. Uh, and that's really the core point here.
Thanks. Thank you so much, Christina, for that very broad overview and interesting financial concepts. So, we have question time again. Yes. Ooh, too far. <laughs> oh, well done, sir. Hi. Hi. Um, I, uh, lead, uh, I'm, uh, I lead the green transition for this region based on the uh, county level. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the questions I had uh, a few weeks ago when it came to green investments was, and according to your slide here, where would you place these companies, especially in this region? So if I was a... a uh, a company delivering to the oil and gas industry, and I was buying my steel, or reused steel, or renewable steel, and I was buying my electricity, uh, renewable electricity, and buying uh, carbon credits for what I didn't get, would you then place me as a green company? Would I be getting a better loan in the company because I was buying renewable steel? Or where would you place me, even though I'm delivering into the oil and gas industry? Would you differentiate my loan then? How would that work? So that's a really interesting question. And I think the way to start is by backing up a little bit and saying that the investors in climate finance or in sustainability have different preferences. Uh, so some of them would say that actually we don't want to invest in the oil and gas industry at all, no matter what they're transitioning, because that's not our strategy. Uh, and then you have others who, on the other end, will just divest from coal and everything else is okay. Uh, so what we do as a research institute is just to provide the transparency so that the investors can make their own decisions, and there is a lot of diversity here. So when we look at uh, companies in the oil and gas sector especially, what we're really looking at is the risk of lock-in and how quickly you might be able to transition. So what we want to avoid is, because the, the infrastructure that we're building today will be here and it will be a part of the 2050 solution, whether we plan for that or not, right? Because the infrastructure is long lasting. So what we want to avoid is to making infrastructure investments today that will lead to a high emissions 2050 future. So this is the real, the really like the core aspect of what we look at. Um, so obviously for a services firm that is more of say an engineering firm, it's easier to transition than if you're directly involved in the infrastructure investments yourself. So that's just a short answer and we can have a much longer uh, conversation about this because it's quite complex and the most complex thing we do is especially these um, transition industries and the oil and gas and heavy industry sectors. Anyone, oh, that's way too far. Where are my guys? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, good throw. <laughs> I'm really happy that All I don't right. have to do the throwing here. <laughs> oh, does this work? You can hear me? Yeah. Good. So, Jörn Lane Matthiesen, I represent Business Angels Norway, 700 business angels organized. Mm -hmm. So, business angels are more green than later stage investors yeah. because it's our personal money. You know, I would never invest in something very bad. Now, um, we need help from models how green is something. Now, you're presenting this model for, uh, of, you know, brown, lighter brown, less brown, bit brown kind of thing. How concrete are tools can we find to categorize sort of my investments, your investments, I, and on you know something that's so easy that just a simple business angel like me can do it. Yeah. Does it exist? Do you have it for me? So that's a really good question, and I'm actually really happy we got this <laughs> uh, because what we did before starting this project is to do a survey and to see what is out there of existing tools, and what we actually found is that there's there's nothing really there yet. Um, there are the rating agencies, they're starting to do climate risk or incorporating that into their, their analysis, but they don't really have the climate research expertise and they also really o only do the very largest companies, as you know. So this could be one source for some investors. Um, and you also have some specialized ESG um, ratings analysis, but they generally look at broader sustainability, so they don't look specifically at climate risk and impact. Um, and then you have the broad climate research, but it's not really structured in such a way that it's useful to the individual investor. 
so this question that you have is a big part of the motivation that we had for seeing if we could help develop this type of tool. So unfortunately, nothing yet, but hopefully in, uh, in some time, you'll have this tool that you're looking for. Anyone else want to try and catch the box? Yes, perfect. Over there, please. Hi. Hello, I'm uh, Anders. I'm an impact investor. So I'm from Catvolt. So the question is about uh, financial profit. Um, so we, as impact investors, we believe that we create outsized returns financial-wise because we invest in uh, solving the biggest problems in the world. Have you seen any kind of statistical uh, data sets on, on financial return in, in the, this space? And, and if you could elaborate a little bit what's going on and, and what you see there? Yeah, so um, yes, but I'm going to be a little bit careful here because the financial return side of it is not my area of expertise and we work with, uh, with bankers to help them on the environmental aspects. Um, the research that I have come across is mainly on the public publicly traded stocks, and it does show that at least there is no um, downside to investing sustainably, and most of the studies that I've seen also show that there is an upside to sustainable investing um, in a broader sense. I haven't seen so much looking specifically at climate risk um, or in the smaller sense, but I'm actually seeing um, a very well-read investor sitting right here, Sineva Bratstedt from Storbrand, so maybe she would like to comment. <laughs> <laughs> to just put you on the spot. Box, please. <laughs> well caught. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, well, and thank you for that. Um, well, when it comes to impact investing, uh, you very neatly summarized that, uh, Christina. So I think you're right. We've, <laughs> well, I work as a sustainability investor uh, also, um, but we've, we mainly invest in the large companies uh, that are publicly traded. And I think in general, what we see is that companies that are well positioned um, to the sustainable development goals of the UN and to solve the big societal challenges, uh, also linked to the Paris Agreement specifically, is a massive force. And we see a large upside for sure, uh, which is why we develop um, sustainable tools or sustainability analysis tools to evaluate the companies that um, we see are well positioned. So from, how to say, <laughs> uh, investing pension funds and pension money for, for 1.3 million people in Norway, uh, we definitely invest those in the most sustainable companies and try to divest in a controlled manner from the ones that haven't taken a stand and we wouldn't have done that if we didn't believe it would provide solid returns over time. Okay. Thanks. Hey, thank you. Thank you, guest speaker Sunniva. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you.